This is Jonathan Ferguson, the keeper of firearms and artillery at the Royal Armouries Museum in the UK, which houses a collection of thousands of iconic weapons from throughout history. And on this week's episode, he's taking another look at the weapons of Fallout New Vegas, but this time with a twist. They're all mods. I instinctively want it to look exactly like it did in the movie. This is a problem, this is my problem, not the not the mods problem, but I do understand and appreciate why you would make it fit, because a pulse rifle in Fallout makes no sense. If you want to see more of Jonathan reacting to Fallout guns, make sure to subscribe as we've got three videos on Bethesda's iconic franchise, and if you'd like to help out the Royal Armouries Museum and continue to support Jonathan's work, check out the links in the description of this video. Right, over to Jonathan. Wow, well if you'd have told me that this was an official Fallout gun, I would just assume that I missed it in the game because it's very much in keeping. Ludicrously large, lots of pipes and, and bells and whistles sticking out of it. With that sort of retro 50s-esque car parts look to it, I, I like this quite a bit. I'm not sure of the significance of the word charge in little lights at the back there. I don't know if that's there all the time or if I missed something. I like the fact it's got a badge on it that, again, looks like a car badge. And the name, slightly comedy name of the, of the Murderlizer is uh, is also a nice touch. The, the ominous crackle of electrical energy and, the, and a cool sound effect. What's not to like? Uh, now this one's a little bit more cursed, I think it's fair to say. No offence to the to the creator of it, but I, I suspect they would agree with me. Now this is the Browning High Power, which is in the base game, and everything else I think is additional. It has a wooden buttstock. Now the, the Browning HP 1935, GP 1935, did have the ability to fit a shoulder stock to it. Yeah, so far so good. Extended magazine, if you watch uh, footage or see pictures of the Iranian embassy siege in 1980 with the SAS, they had Browning high powers with uh, I believe it was a 25 round extended magazine sticking out of them that's not a new thing for the high power either and it's a very common thing available for pistols across the board today the muzzle compensator getting maybe a bit more exotic it's that that's more of a, a race gun thing so a competition pistol for shooting accurately but quickly keeping the muzzle down and then actually fitting with that somewhat is the sight rail which is a fairly classic IPSC style open class setup ish <laughs> from maybe the 90s with a rail uh, attached to the dust cover of the frame of the pistol and then allowing this which allows the slide to operate underneath it uh, underneath the actual rail that's attached to the side Mount. All of these elements, or, or two or more of these elements, might work together, arguably. The thing that kind of breaks it is the knuckle duster attached to the trigger guard. There's really no way to use that practically as a knuckle duster. It could only function as just an impact weapon, and your gun is already an impact weapon, especially with that compensator on the end. So I don't know if they've modded this to be customizable or if this is the standard look of this weapon. If this is the default configuration of the weapon, the knuckle duster doesn't make much sense. I think someone just thought, let's add everything we possibly can think of to the Browning. <laughs> Some of you will know or remember that I do really like the MP5 as a classic modern firearm. Now this, for within the limitations of this game's graphics, this is this is a solid effort. It does seem to be missing the ejection port and therefore the the visible bolt inside the weapon, which we should we should be able to see on the right hand side. The overall type is of course the MP5K and it's looking good. The front grip doesn't look quite right from memory. I didn't grab one to refer to today, but the stop at the front of the front grip is, the proportions don't look quite right. I think they're working within some strict polygon limitations here and I think they've done a good job. And there is some, some weathering on the edges. Now it looks like there's weathering on the edges of the trigger mechanism housing, uh, which is not correct, but they may have been referencing the Hollywood converted MP5, such as we see in Die Hard, uh, which uses the HK94 civilian version of the MP5 from back in the 80s, with the barrel cut down and a few other components changed around. And they have this metallic trigger group with the plastic pistol grip, like a G3. This is basically the, the more modern, 
polymer trigger group of an MP5 or an MP5K, but as I say, they seem to have a dividing line on the graphics between the polymer bit and what appears to be a metal bit. But I may be reading too much into this. So this, this submachine gun, although it's being used as a machine pistol here, really folding stock, I very much doubt there's, there's the mechanic to let you unfold that. But it is, it is a submachine gun on the face of it. This thing, this is the uh, Volta MPL. Aesthetically, it fits the wasteland, I think. In terms of rarity, in our t uh, reality at least, you're not gonna find Volta MPLs lying around, I don't think. Okay, so on the manufacturer's name issue, uh, I, the in-game name is the Volta Volt Tech SMG. So actually, this apparently is made by the same company as it was in our reality. It's just that Volt Tech have sponsored it, or it's a particular variant that they adopted as a standard armament. Of course, they didn't in the in the base game, but let's pretend that they did. Now, speaking of sponsorship, Nuka-Cola sponsorship. There's a sort of medallion in the left side of the trigger mechanism of the, or the grip frame. And there's another Nuka-Cola kind of what looks dangerously like a charm attached to the front left. And the, the only place this thing lets itself down really, sorry guys, is, this, is the random stuff wrapped around the grip syndrome. This is just a video game thing that constantly is done. I get why but it's not necessary. If you're gonna do this, make it necessary. So have the grips missing or have them visibly damaged. Maybe the screws have fallen out and you're holding on the grip panels with a piece of whatever that is. Not everything you design has to have a function, but for nerds like me, we get excited when it does. Okay, so here's a gun that mm, arguably doesn't make sense in the Fallout timeline, although it is arguable, but it does in the spirit, it's very much in the spirit of Fallout, with the term we use in, in my world is craft produced, previously homemade, but this is, a, this is several notches above homemade, this is uh, more of a small factory product, because this is, as the name actually tells us, the Chechen Bors, or Bors, forgive my pronunciation, but this is a very nicely done rendition of this design. Lots of detail, the knurling on the on the um, barrel nut and on the end cap, wouldn't expect to see that. I'd, I'd have thought that would get fudged into some lines or some dots or something, but lots of detail, including the wear. There's attention to detail in terms of the different, how the different parts are made. So turned bits of steel versus sheet or oh, box section steel. The wood looks like it could be wood. Knowing how old this game is and uh, what the limitations, or having an idea of what the limitations are in, in modding this, uh, I'm really impressed with this one in particular. Right, this is this is going to need, I hate this word, but it's going to need some unpacking. So we've, we've got a type, a type 3 AK Kalashnikov rifle, which is not in the base game, so that's a mod in itself. Um, what looks to, what's close to a PBS-1 style sound suppressor, which is a real suppressor for the AK, and then this insane magazine. Now it's not actually as insane as it looks because something very close to this, I don't think this is quite right in terms of how it attaches at the front, was, as far as I know, legitimately experimented with in um, Soviet Russia. But not on the AK, it was on the AKM. I think it was a hundred rounds, but I'm not entirely sure on that. And it did actually have to clip to the front of the rifle. Now the bit, and the, re the reason it's different is this doesn't seem to attach to anything. So the curvature must be wrong here, or the barrel length is wrong, because it should be flush with the muzzle, and it should have a, a sheet metal bracket on the what would be the lower back bit of the magazine, but here is just all back to front and upside down, and that would fit over the muzzle. I'd, I'm not even sure how it was how it was attached to the weapon. I've only ever seen a, a black and white picture of of this. Uh, now, for pretty obvious reasons, that was never adopted, but it's based on, as far as I know a genuine thing, or it's a very convincing hoax from the 60s or 70s. What's that? As much as I can't condone the uh, wanton slaughter of domesticated animals, that does, that does a graphic demonstration of what a mine on a stick might do 
if a mine on a stick were a plausible weapon, which I don't think it is. This appears to be, I think it's an anti-tank mine of some sort, that has been sort of lashed to the end of a pool cue, creating a sort of really badly balanced javelin, and then it sort of has an, some, somehow it has an impact fuse. Now I definitely wouldn't want to have one of these thrown at me in case it did somehow initiate. If it's at all plausible, the user would be at as much risk of it going off as the victim would be at risk of receiving the resulting explosion. The mines require quite a lot of direct pressure, depending on whether they're anti-personnel or anti-tank. Let's assume this is some sort of anti-personnel mine, therefore. If, you, I mean, the, the way it's sort of lashed on would be, is pretty questionable. You'd probably, you'd probably set it off in the course of creating it? I don't know. And then you'd have to ha sort of try and hit the target square on to actually get it to reliably, or at all, go off. It's a, it's a it's a fun idea. It's maybe the wrong wrong phrase. <laughs> I can't help thinking about how you'd really do it. But uh, yeah, not not really recommended. Instantly mixed feelings here because it's a pulse rifle. So on some level, I ha I I have to appreciate that, and I do. I think this is deliberate. It, they haven't just changed it for sort of for the hell of it or for copyright reasons. I think this is. What would a pulse rifle look like if it had been invented in the Fallout universe? And if that was the design intent, I think they've done a great job. I instinctively want it to look exactly like it did in the movie. This is a problem, this is my problem, not the not the mods problem, but I do understand and appreciate why you would make it fit. Because a pulse rifle in Fallout makes no sense. They have, interestingly, they've not included the Thompson gun in the design. The, as a lot of you will know, the pulse rifle was built fundamentally on a Thompson submachine gun, heavily disguised, but you can still see that bit of receiver, the cocking handle. I will just say that the, the label on the side that says fragile handle with care, I don't know if that's a, an in-joke or something, but um, the pulse rifle is meant to be, uh, in, in the movie, a robust military weapon. And the way they made these props was to, they made them perfectly, and then Simon Atherton, the armourer, threw them into the corner of a room repeatedly until they had that battered, worn look that you see in the movie, like they've been around for 10 years at least. That, that uh, conflicts slightly with the fragile handle with care sticker. I must admit my initial reaction to this was yikes, and that's because I saw the, the bolt, rather like the infamous trailer for uh, a recent Call of Duty game, the bolt actually clips straight out of the back of the gun. Although in that case, they designed it to look like it should come out of the gun. Here, it seems to be, maybe this is a work in progress, I don't know, but it clearly should not be coming out of the back of the gun. If it did, there'd be a big hole, and then we wouldn't see the, yeah, actually PPSH shaped. Oh, this is the top cover latch, actually. That's that's there on the model, and we wouldn't see that. There'd be a gaping hole. Now, I think this is meant to be a homemade take on the Papasha, so I can't be too critical of it. I don't think you would bother to shape, if you were making a gun from scratch, you would not try to replicate slavishly the stamped steel construction of the um, body of this gun. I, there wouldn't be any, any advantage to doing that, unless you just wanted it to look like a, a, a papasha. In which case, make it look more like one. But we've got a sort of wasteland looking improvised steel buttstock and pistol grip on that, replacing the traditional wooden stock. I guess my main issue with this design is the magazine. So they've gone for a version of the standard curved box magazine that was introduced later on to, to essentially replace the less reliable and much more expensive drum magazines of the Fabisha. But this magazine design is not amazing, unfortunately. It's um, weirdly open. I mean, that magazine body would distort very easily because it's sheet metal with no support down the sides. It's cut open far too much and it has no space in the bottom for the magazine spring. So it would not function as shown. There's a lot been said about the SA-80, L85A2 in this particular form. So, doing, as I often do, a straightforward visual comparison here with the real thing. A lot of the detail is right, but unfortunately, it's too short. Quite dramatically too short, actually. But I think it's only in the barrel, so it's almost like it's got the, well, or something closer to the carbine, the L22A2 carbine length barrel fitted although it's probably not a match for that either. So the, the flash suppressor should not 
start at the front of the rail system. As you can see, there's a good two and a half, slightly more than that, inches of barrel before you get to that because the SAAT has always had a full length, 20 inch M16 length barrel in a short overall package, which was really the main thing about the SA80. Right, now this is the this is a game engine problem, but when the player cocks the weapon, he does so up here, as though there's a cocking handle or a charging handle up at the front of the gun. There is not, of course. Uh, one of the uh, sort of ergonomic quirks of the SA80 is that you have to flip the gun over and cock it with your left hand over the gun. The game clearly doesn't permit anything like the proper drills <laughs> for, the, for this rifle, and so um, they've had to they've had to fudge the reload. They have at least done it on the on the on the right hand side of the gun, which is where it should happen, and it happens very quickly, so it's it's barely noticeable, especially in first person. I like this design quite a bit. This appears to be entirely original. There's a lot of attention to detail here in that it's using what look like improvised components. So um, threaded bits of pipe, you know, random bits of wood that have been you know, finished into, into the shape you would need them to be. A magazine from something else. Uh, maybe maybe it's meant to be a grease gun magazine given that this is I think 45 ACP pistol cartridge. Uh, the, the pistol cartridge is a great choice for relatively lower pressures so you're not having to worry as much about the gun blowing up. I think the only failing of this gun is a failing of a lot of real life craft produced firearms, which is that they don't pay enough attention to the sighting system. Now the designer of this has in game terms, because it has uh, a rear aperture sight. I, I would guess it's meant to be repurposed off a real gun, but there's no front sight to, to align it with. So whereas in the game, it's, well, you've already got the reticle to aim with, so kind of irrelevant anyway, but cosmetically it works as a sight. Intuitively, it works as a sight because you have something to look through. But in real life, you'd have no way of aligning that shot and it could go almost anywhere in a pretty wide cone. Somewhat constrained by your cheek being on the stock and the hole being in front of your eye, it's gonna reduce the cone somewhat, but not ideal. For the work that's gone into this design, if it was real, you would want to design in a tall post front sight to match up with this and then try to zero them so that your shot, your um, point of aim coincides with your point of impact at a known range and then you would know roughly where to aim. Because as it is, you've got really no idea. Luckily, I guess, we have that. <laughs> I think there's a movie where the rock fires a, a Browning M2 50 cal from the hip. Suffice to say, that is not plausible in real life. Well, it is. If, if you're the size of the rock, you can physically do it, but only with blanks. Um, the recoil generated by actual 50 BMG rounds is... Like, even he cannot keep that thing on target for more than one shot, I would, I would suggest. Uh, please don't fight me, the rock. I have some issues as well with, um, okay, I mean, the feed mechanism is essentially, or feed arrangements are basically as they would be if this was mounted. Uh, in fact, the recoil, or lack of, is basically as though, as though this was mounted to a fixed pedestal mount, and therefore all the recoil forces are going down through the pedestal into the floor of a vehicle, and therefore the gun wouldn't move. The firing mechanism, they have put a pistol, like a sort of vertical pistol grip on top of the top plate of the gun. That's fine in terms of that's not the top cover that lifts up because you wouldn't want it on that. It's on the actual fixed top plate of the gun. It's in the way of the sights, but you can't use the sights anyway. The problem is how that would interface with the actual firing mechanism. You would have to create a linkage, a hole in the top of the top plate and some sort of linkage to reach the actual trigger mechanism. Trying to work out how this would work in real life is a fool's errand because it can't be done. Not the first weapon I think of when I think Fallout Universe. This is the, the Hecaro Cock VP70. So a few issues with this thing. The player's arm, I haven't spoken about, this is a problem with several of these mods, is in that the sort of geometry of everything is such that when you radically change a model like this, fixed poses of the character are gonna be a problem. So inevitably, in, like in this case, the forearm clips right through this unusual thumb hole stock arrangement. Absolutely not not the, the uh, designer's fault. They've got, they've got detail on here, so, on this side of the gun is the fire selector. So putting the stock on the gun turns it into a machine pistol. Pulling up on the lever 
puts up this um, sort of disconnector overrider is really what this is. The slide comes back, it runs over that and does not disconnect the trigger from the rest of the gun, which means that it keeps firing. However, it's not as simple as that because this is a three round burst only mechanism. So it actually counts <laughs> how many shots you fired and then disconnects the trigger. So you only get three rounds out of this. So the rate of fire on this is too low, what that boils down to, and it should only be spitting out three rounds per pull of the trigger. Why am I not surprised that someone has created a Pancor jackhammer for New Vegas? This is this is um, one of the infamous guns that is more of a video game gun than it is a real gun, even though it was designed as a real gun and produced, or prototypes were produced. But suffice to say that uh, drum-fed bullpup shotguns in general have not really caught on, and this thing sadly hasn't either, but um, the designer could have some certain amount of pride in the life it's had in video games. You know, represented here basically as it's as it as it the real thing. It's got the correct name, it's not got a fictional name. It hasn't been changed we don't have because there's three of them in the world, we don't have one. But um I think that's a a pretty close approximation of the design. Now I, I would say that the, the reload and animation of this is, is a bit fudged, but actually it's it's no more fudged really than than the real gun because you had to partially disassemble the gun to replace the, the drum magazine. So you, once you'd fired the shots in the cylinder, once you'd fired those shots, that was it really. Uh, it is automatic, or was designed to be automatic, so that depiction is, is correct. But if you're, if you're thinking, God, that's a really low poly, not very good model. Yeah, the, the gun itself is a low poly gun. <laughs> Now I think this one has to just be a bit of fun. Um, I believe there is um, there is one gameplay mechanic where this would play a role in that if you have a essentially a concealed weapon and you go into a something like a, a casino, you get to keep that weapon, whereas you would have to hand in your conventional weapons. So presumably what it was invented to allow, which is which is a nice bit of creativity. From, from memory, there's at least one attempt at a spy camera with a gun built into it. It's not something we have in our collection, but I, I believe that was tried at least once in the Cold War period. Perhaps that's where they got this from, or at least the idea for this. Uh, we, we even get a scope view that looks somewhat like a camera viewfinder, which is a nice touch. If you'd like to support our work here at the Royal Armouries Museum, we have the link in the description for, for how to do that. Otherwise, check out our various social media platforms, our YouTube channel, which I'm fairly heavily featured on, if you like that sort of thing. Failing that, I'll see you again next time. Thanks again, guys.